Good morning, Lansdowne. Lovely to see you this morning. Well, where were you last Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock? I was stuck in the traffic chaos created by the big football game at the Gold Sands Stadium, Dean Court. If you don't know what all the fuss is about, Bournemouth AFC are pushing for a place in the Premier League. But I have to say that if, you, if they do get promotion, I dread to think how gridlocked the town will become when the big boys turn up from Manchester, Liverpool, Chelsea and Arsenal. Anyway, at about five past seven, I was in a painfully slow-moving queue just beyond the St. Paul's roundabout on the Wessex Way. I only realized what was happening when I read the sticker on the rear window of the car in front of me. Eddie Howe's Barmy Army. I knew I was caught, so we sat inching our way up the slip road towards Boscombe, then along Holdenhurst Road. Behind this car, which was rocking with noise as red and white uh, scarves billowed out of the windows. Do you know, I even spotted along the route members of Lansdowne Baptist Church walking towards the game. I won't tell you who they were, Joe Nesbitt. Um, <laughs> they were, of course, impeccably behaved. But it really was pandemonium. Noise, confusion, blaring horns, police riot squads on street corners to keep Joe uh, in check, fever pitch excitement. I just can't imagine how local residents and shopkeepers and restaurant and bar owners have very different perspectives on the impact of that kind of football game on the economy and on the environment. I was still in the car 40 minutes later and about to turn right into Older Road when I had this mischievous thought. What if I wound down the window and with a loud hailer shouted, match cancelled! The stadium is being demolished. And what's all that got to do with Palm Sunday? Well, they reckon that rather like match day in Bournemouth, the population of Jerusalem would quadruple during Passover week as pilgrims from all over the world crammed into the city. Every B&B would have been booked months in advance as people enjoyed that week-long festival, celebrating their national identity with its focus there being the temple. The event, Passover, traced its roots, of course, to the Hebrew liberation from Egypt under Moses all those centuries before. So this week, for Jews, carried powerful associations. It had, as we say, history. And into this cauldron, Jesus arrives on a donkey. It is, in fact, the only time the Gospels record Jesus riding anywhere. Pilgrims were expected to walk into the city for Passover. So this was a rather strange thing for Jesus to do. Strange, unless there was something deliberate and strategic in his actions. And that, of course, is precisely Mark's point as he describes the drama of Jesus last week there in our reading from chapter 11. At every stage, Jesus is in control of the events. He is not the victim of circumstances or the pawn in a game between religion and politics. He is fulfilling his mission. So let's see how Mark uh, wants us to understand the mission of Jesus as he unravels chapter 11. The first action is this donkey ride. It is a fulfillment of ancient scripture. You see, the whole thing was, was prearranged very carefully, wasn't it? If you look at the text, the owner of the colt from a nearby village would be expecting the disciples of Jesus to turn up. And he knew the password, should any questions be asked. Tell him the Lord needs it. Of course, Mark's Jewish readers understood entirely the significance of what was going on from their Old Testament. Genesis 49 and verse 11 promised a ruler who will tether his donkey to a vine and his colt to the choicest branch. Zechariah the prophet, chapter 9, verse 9, looked forward to the day when Jerusalem would 
Rejoice greatly. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. And then there are those quotations in our passage there in verse 9 from Psalm 118, shouted by the Galileans who've traveled up to the big city to support Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they cry. To which they then add their own interpretation, verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna, Jesus, save us. Bring in David's kingdom. Of course, Jesus does not stop their enthusiasm. He has, after all, engineered the whole thing quite deliberately. But it does represent a new approach of his to public relations. You see, if you know the gospel narrative to this point, Jesus has consciously avoided publicity. He has resisted going public. He's told his disciples to keep their heads down and his identity as Messiah close to their chests. But now it's all changing. But even this donkey ride into the city is actually Jesus fulfilling ancient scripture, not popular expectations. Jesus is no freedom fighter at the head of a, a bunch of vigilantes. He's no five-star general leading an army into battle. No, he is still the humble king in disguise. And the kingdom he introduces is not going to be the product of an urban political revolution. In fact, it is not the city itself, but the temple that Jesus is interested in. And that's why Mark says quite carefully in verse 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. You see, there is another deliberate move by Jesus. He is targeting the temple, that great center of Jewish religious life, the symbol of their identity. But the text says it was late when he gets to the temple. So we'll have to wait for the following morning before Jesus makes his intentions known. For one thing is clear, this is not going to be one of those pleasant city tourist breaks. No, Jesus is going to pronounce a judgment on current worship. That is the second dramatic action of Christ as he clears the temple. But we don't really understand it fully until we have chewed on one of Mark's classic sandwiches. Yes, Mark often writes his gospel by folding one event within two others, like a sandwich, so that the meaning is tucked into the middle. Let's look at this Mark sandwich then. In the morning, on their way back to the temple, Jesus wants to stop and have breakfast on the road. He sees a fig tree. He approaches the fig tree, but when he reaches it, there's no fruit. It's bare, just leaves. And in the last recorded miracle of Jesus in Mark's gospel, he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And Mark comments, his disciples heard him say it. It's a rather strange one, that, isn't it? Until we realize that the fig tree was a popular Jewish national symbol of their prosperity and God's blessing upon their lives. A few weeks ago, on March the 1st, if you were in Wales and Welsh, you would have been wearing a daffodil or a leek to celebrate St. David's Day. There's a well-known uh, pop star called Keris Matthews who sings a song with a line, Every day when I wake up, I thank the Lord that I am Welsh. On April the 23rd, in a few weeks' time, on St. George's Day, if you are English, you may possibly wear a rose. And for all I know, you may wake up and thank the Lord that you're English. If you wanted to be a good Jew, then you'd sit under your heavily laden fig tree. So here is King Jesus 
coming in God's name to his city to see how fruitful it is, how spiritually productive, and what does he find? No fruit. Not even the hint of something. Nothing but leaves. Now, hold that idea, that bit of the sandwich, because the incident over, the disciples move on. But that's the outside of the sandwich. So we come to the bit in the middle, as Mark tells his story, as Jesus there in verse 15 cleanses the temple. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But then, the next day, we have the other side of the sandwich. As the disciples are walking along, they see that fig tree again, and it is dead, just as Jesus had predicted. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed it's withered. Of course, by reacting so strongly to what was going on in the temple, Jesus had exposed the barrenness of temple religion and condemned it. So the fruitlessness of the fig tree is an acted parable of the judgment of God on the temple. The temple that was the focal point of Israel's religion, the place where God's name was worshipped and proclaimed, not just to Jews, but to the nations. And yet, what does Jesus find there? He finds a marketplace. Now, it was okay to help pilgrims who traveled a long way to Jerusalem to purchase the necessary sacrifices for worship. That was fine. Traditionally, that had all taken place across the, the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives. But in AD 30, Caiaphas, the high priest, had decided to set up the market stalls in the outer precincts of the temple during the festival. And so Jesus' anger is directed at the fact that religion had become big business. The purpose of the temple had been lost as a consequence. Therefore, in verse 17, quoting Isaiah 56, verse 7, Jesus has to remind them of what that temple purpose is. My house will be called the house of prayer for all nations. Israel was to carry the light of God's truth to the world. It was to be a house for mission. And yet, ironically, it was the outer court of the Gentiles in the temple which had been taken over by the money changers and the stallholders. The house of God had become a place for insiders only. And God's patience has finally run out. So you see, in the cleansing of the temple and the withering of the fig tree, Jesus expresses God's frustrated hunger for true religion. A new temple is needed. A new community of faith must come into being. And that is the meaning of our final section from verse 22, with its promise of future blessing. Look at the text. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. You see, Peter and the other disciples, on seeing that withered fig tree, wondered how on earth there could now be a future for the people of God. If it was all over for the temple a building which had been around for so long and, and pivotal to the nation's understanding of and engagement with God, what hope was there? Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, if anyone says uh, to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart but believes, then what he says will be done for him. So, does this passage therefore mean that we are to walk around on Palm Sunday morning cursing fig trees and shouting to the Purbex to fall into Swanage Bay? Somehow I don't think that's the application, do you? Of course, Jesus is using exaggerated language here to make a point. But what's his point? 
Jesus' point is surely that God is able to bring into being a new community of worshipping people who will produce the sort of lives he longs to see. And that future community is going to be characterized by two features. Faith, seen in prayer, that believes in the power of God. Therefore, verse 24, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's the first feature in this new community that God is building, in this new temple, faith which believes in the power of God through prayer, will be evident. And secondly, forgiveness. Verse 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So it's faith that believes in the power of God and forgiveness seen in relationships which practice the grace of God. For that is the new day which the death and resurrection of Jesus will bring about. And of course, we are living in that new day. He, Jesus, is the centerpiece of a new community. And by faith in him, we are part of it. Jesus is the cornerstone of a new temple of God made up not of ancient bricks, but of people like us. This new community, no longer located in one sacred space in Jerusalem, but an international cross-cultural people who share the life of God through faith in Christ, wherever they meet. And one of the marks of this community will be active faith in God, who can accomplish great things through prayer. Here, people will believe that there is nothing beyond God's power and they will practically trust God for everything. That's how people will approach the big issues of their lives. You see, it is not the amount of faith which is significant. It's the object of faith. So we go to God and we discover his power through prayer. For faith doesn't remove mountains, God does as we bring those situations to him. Prayer, praise in impossible contexts and against impossible odds. But isn't that when God's power is most obviously on the move? When in the when in the light of impossible situations, we believe that nothing is impossible for the God who hears and answers prayer. For prayer is the great sign of faith at work. But says Jesus, for prayer to be effective, not only must faith in God be present, but also forgiveness of others. That is the second mark of the new community which belongs to Christ. And if you think about it, the best environment for prayer is one in which there is the forgiving spirit being demonstrated. For one of the, uh, the blockages to, to uh, removing the obstacles, the mountains in your life, if you like, is that unforgiving attitude. We've been marking, haven't we, as, as a world, this past week, the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, when horrifically, within a hundred days, nearly a million people, primarily from the minority Tutsi group, were killed by the Hutus. You see, in parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe, the prevailing culture is still one of tribal feuds and family honor killings and, and blood revenge without mercy. But in this community which God is building, there is to be a culture of forgiveness. The writing of, of broken relationships, the granting of mercy to others, the reconciling of enemies, and in that environment, Prayer 
to God becomes incredibly powerful and effective. So let me move towards the major applications from this message this morning. Let me ask two questions. Here's the first. What drives our worship? What drives our church life, I guess? What drives it? What motivates our worship at LBC? Profit or prayer? In the West, there is today a very real danger that religion is being increasingly turned into big business. You see, if we're not careful, we can market religion the way we do the latest car or a fitness regime. Faith in Jesus becomes little more than a product to be promoted, a commodity to be consumed, a, a technique to be applied. Jesus in such a world is, uh, is just one more item to be added to the comfortable mix of our lifestyle. What drives our worship? Profit or prayer? Now, this doesn't mean that the church should be poorly managed, inefficiently organized, or unprofessional in its approach. No, far from it. We need good business plans. We need state-of-the-art websites and publicity strategies and risk assessments and good governance. There's nothing unspiritual about, about that list of, of things. But the danger, the danger is that we can turn knowing God into an arm of Saatchi and Saatchi. We can create a Jesus brand. And in the process, we can miss the whole point of our faith. We can confuse the, the fruitfulness of faith with hitting targets and, and growing market share and creating an attractive image. I've been thinking about this a lot during the past few weeks. Perhaps one of the greatest dangers we face here at LBC as a church in the next few years as we look to build a new modern first-rate facility as we create a business plan with innovative programs as we introduce new governance structures all good things by the way perhaps one of our greatest dangers is that we might begin to think that it all depends upon us and our finance and our abilities and our skills and in the process if we are not very careful we will lose touch with one of our core values one which Jesus identifies here in the passage prayer my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations of course that, that sounds simple enough Prayer. But ask any Christian, ask yourself this morning, which aspect of your faith you find most demanding? And I guarantee many of us will say, you know, my prayer life, Peter. That's what I find really tough, day in, day out. Ask any church leadership, which area of church life is the least well supported? And nine times out of ten, they'll say, it's... The prayer ministry, the prayer gathering, to get commitment to corporate prayer, to raise the level of personal prayer is perhaps the greatest challenge facing the Christian church in the West with all its sophisticated uh, advertising techniques and its, and its relative wealth. You see, we can, we can get musicians, we can get Sunday school teachers, we can get youth leaders. But prayers, that is an altogether different mountain to move. And yet, though the Father's house may be a preaching house or a counseling house, if it isn't a house of prayer, then it isn't the Father's house. The other core value which Jesus identifies as missing in Israel's temple worship 
is a concern for those who do not yet belong, for outsiders. And so the question, what drives our worship, prophet or prayer? Insiders or outsiders? God wanted the doors of the temple to be open to everyone. Not just those who belonged to the club and had paid their membership fees. That's what frustrated Jesus. But for the temple authorities, it was their income stream which mattered, their comfort zones. So outsiders, the Gentiles, well, they were dispensable. We can close down the outer precinct where they normally gather. Their needs were not important enough. You can shut down their space for worship, fill it with the tables of the money changers. As long as we keep the insiders happy and the business going, let the outsiders sort themselves out. My friends, every time a church, every time a small group, every time a Christian displays that sort of self-interest, we miss the heart of God. Every time a church and its leadership is more interested in pleasing the insiders at the expense of reaching the outsiders, it misses the heart of God. Every time the budget, the priorities, the decisions of a local church are more weighted to keeping the traditions going rather than making the local community and evangelism and mission a priority, it misses the heart of God. Do you get that? Do you see that? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so here's the, the third question, the third tension. Prophet or prayer, insiders or outsiders? Maintenance or mission? You can see what's on the Father's heart. As Jesus understood it, he wanted his people to be a light to the nations. So this house of prayer was to be a house of prayer for everyone, for the nations. Authentic worship is driven by a passion for the glory of God among those who do not yet know him and who are not yet followers of Jesus. And a church that is focused on mission will move the tables to make room for the Gentiles. It will not tell the Gentiles, this is our gig, go away. No, a church that beats with the Father's heart will reflect the Father's heart in its programs, in its priorities. It will make a priority of reaching the lost. Its people will be committed to mission, local, national, and global. And I believe that God will bless a church which is committed in this way to welcoming and engaging with the thousands upon thousands who think still that Christianity is a middle class religion or a faith for women and children only. Here's the call it's a big call. A church that is prepared to remove the clutter from the outer court of the Gentiles is a church that's following God's agenda. A church that wants to remove the things that make it difficult for people to hear the good news of Christ in their own language is a church living with the heart of God. Frankly, it's as brutal as this. If we opt for maintenance, we actually opt for closure. For death. For God, as is very clear here in the way that Jesus cleanses the temple, God is no more bound to Christian churches with a long pedigree than he is to Israel with a much longer one. If there is no fruit in prayerfulness, in evangelism, in love and ministry to the community, God will judge such churches, and they will die. So folks, here at LBC, what drives our worship? 
our life as a church? Prayer? It's really good that we're going to start now a, a prayer ministry after each service. And let me encourage you, if you want to pray about something, talk to somebody and pray about something, then, then just come down the front as folks are going into the, into the hub and drinking and over there. You, you can just come down the front here. And we'll, we've got a team of folks who'll, who pray with you and ask God to be with you. It's good that we make that a priority. Prayer. Outsiders. What's our heart for the community like? How much are we willing to, 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 to make room for those who don't yet know Jesus? And how, how, big, how big is your map of what God's doing in the world? Is this a house of prayer for the nations? That's the question then. What drives worship? But I guess the best answer to that question is another one. Who's the focus of our worship? Is it some celebrity hero or the servant king? Who's the focus of our worship? We live, don't we, in an age of celebrity? And in such an age, we can be tempted to turn Jesus into the ad man's dream. We can promote his message in terms which are more acceptable to our society, obsessed as it is with success and self-fulfillment, with, 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 with being significant and powerful. But the real Jesus of the Gospels is not that kind of hero. And his message is not that kind of message. Neither is the community which follows Jesus. We are not to ape and imi imitate and mimic the culture that surrounds us. We're to challenge that culture by our lifestyle, by our values, by our message. I, I think the church in the West needs to be very careful when society shouts about the church, Hosanna! And scatters palm branches in the path of the people of God. There's always a great danger that when the church finds herself sitting at the top table with the politicians and academics, with the sports and pop stars, that she may be, a, she may be tempted to abandon the way of the cross. You read your history. The influence of the Christian voice in history has often been more significant outside the corridors of power when the authorities have tried to silence her claims and crucify her values just as they did with Jesus. The church speaks with so much more authority when she is outside the establishment, freed from the temptations of power and the trappings of success. That's when the church has her prophetic value and calling. Not that the church has to seek weakness or powerlessness. We don't have to go looking for it. It'll come our way as we live for Christ. You see, some in the crowds on Palm Sunday, they wanted a hero who would get rid of Rome, kick out the occupying forces. Jesus wanted them to have a savior who would defeat the power of sin and death. That's why Jesus turns down their offer of celebrity status and chooses instead the path of sacrifice and service. You see, the crowds were thinking in terms of, of national self-interest, but Jesus had the world on his heart. Of course the Lord Jesus wants regime change, but the revolution he seeks begins in the human heart with a new way of life which puts loving God and others first. And the Lord Jesus came from heaven to the cross to make that possible. He lived and died not as a cult hero, but as the servant king. And that's what drives our worship, Jesus. For he's the object of our worship. 
He's the focus of our devotion. He's the center of our identity. He is our high priest, our king, our savior, our Lord. And he calls us to follow him in the way of his self-giving and, and sacrifice. As we, like the Lord Jesus, make the Father's heart our priority. May God grant us to understand the nature of the gospel and follow our Lord Jesus as a result. We're going to sing as we wrap up this morning. A hymn that uh, makes Jesus the object of our worship. He's king and I will extol him, give him the glory and honor his name. He reigns on high, enthroned in the heavens, word of the Father, exalted for us. So as we come to Christ, let's remember who Jesus is and what it means to follow him and how that should shape our lives and our church agenda and priority. Oh, Holy One, our hearts do adore you. Thrilled with your goodness, we give you our praise. Angels in light, with worship surround him, Jesus, our Savior, forever the same. Let's stand and sing. Thank <laughs> you.